Caroline has gone. I enjoyed our presentation, especially as we, some of us, prepare for another New Year resolution. <laughs> but I was actually surprised to learn that 90% of people fail with their New Year resolution, because that will imply that at least 10% succeed. I've always assumed that not up to 1% succeed with New Year resolution. It may seem mundane, but I don't know how many years I've resolved not to drink Coke. <laughs> the longest period I ever went without drinking Coke was 17 days. <laughs> so if some people succeed in their New Year resolution till March, I mean, we must give them kudos. <laughs> and uh, before our presentation, uh, Pastor Itwa talked to us about Nigeria about the things that make us unique, the challenges we face. But he also spoke about the uniqueness of Nigeria, especially when compared with other Africans. And there is this story told by uh, former Ghanaian President Jerry Rollins. He came to do a presentation in Nigeria a few years ago. And he said, in Nigeria and the Ghanaian, they got to London and they were at the immigration point. The Ghanaian presented his passport. The immigration official looked at it and said, your visa expired yesterday. He said the Ghanaian man was begging. He just moved, in, moved to this side. Then the Nigerian man presented his passport. They said, your visa expired last year. He said, he didn't allow to say, bloody what? <laughs> Lord, look at and all your grandfathers that came to my country. Who gave them visa to come? The senior pastor, Covenant Christian Church, Pastor Poju, Oyemade, all the other pastors and workers of this great ministry. My brother, Professor Chidi Odikalu, and my sister, I saw her, Mrs. Ibukunwa Ushika. I mean, it's a woman I admire so much, but this morning I just went reading through her I discovered that she went to Ife. Hell, of course. Since we are in a church setting, let me begin with the story of an old woman who was very spiritual. She would step out of her house every day, raise her arms to the sky and shout, Praise the Lord. What is your purpose? By critical agencies of government at all levels and the cooperation of all Nigerians, regardless of where they may be. Therefore, between the Lagos state government and the federal government, there was no acrimony, there were no recriminations, and the officials worked together. On the insurgency, we have not seen any demonstration of such cooperation between and among governments and the people. It is a notorious fact that the federal government and the governments of the affected states of Bornu, Adama, and Yobe have not always worked together, essentially because there have been too many people interested in exploiting the tragedy for political end. So what it matters, the cynicism of government officials at all levels has been transferred to the citizens. In most of the northern states, many of the people have been made to believe the lie that the federal government is behind the insurgency. While supporters of the president counter that with their own theory, Boko Haram is a northern campaign to make the country ungovernable for the president. Under such a climate of mutual suspicion, how can we successfully fight terrorism? Even in the South, the disposition of some of our people is better captured by the Yoruba idiom. Kilo Kalon, Oni Biejo, Sanaya, Omer, Kolon, Dan, I know there are too many WhatsApp people here who will not understand. Simply translated or crudely translated, it means why should God be concerned if a snake bites a monkey? Is it not a case of one animal dealing with the other? This is the position of those who have always seen Nigeria within the prison of North and South, and has never really looked at the Boko Haram violence within the broader view of it being a challenge to our common humanity. Two, in dealing with the Ebola challenge, the health authorities in Lagos and Abuja collaborated smoothly 
and so did the political authorities. Health Minister Professor Onyebuji took the South accolade for his efforts, but the greater credit goes to the Lagos State authorities. <laughs> Whatever differences they may hold on other issues, President Jonathan and Governor Fashola were on the same page in the fight against Ebola. We have not seen such cooperation in the fight against insurgency, either at the level of those who superintend our military and security institutions or at the war theaters where many soldiers are deserting. Between the presidency and the state's concern, we are the emergency rule. Whatever it means within the context of the reality on the ground, it's in place that are hardly any meeting grounds. In fact, the kidnapping of over 200 female students of government secondary school Chibo almost six months ago and the unfortunate drama that immediately followed the tragedy is symptomatic of how the war on insurgency has been mismanaged, essentially due to mistrust and the cold calculations over the 2015 general elections. Three, on Ebola, we saw a demonstration of leadership, especially in Lagos State where the governor took charge immediately. Unfortunately, on insurgency, we have not seen anything like that, despite the fact that we are a nation at war. For instance, the moment Fashola's attention was brought to the index case of Mr. Patrick Sawyer, he did not prevaricate on the issue. He moved in quickly not only by making bold, symbolic gestures, visiting the hospital, speaking with the affected people, empathizing with them, but also by putting in place the necessary structures to contain a possible spread. He also cultivated critical constituencies that shape public perception while making effective use of direct communications with the people through regular broadcasts. It is indeed noteworthy that while the crisis lasted, Fashola had regular sessions with religious leaders, traditional rulers, market men and women, and community development associations to brief them of the risk to reassure them that his government was gaining control and to advise them to be cautious but not to panic. A memorable line from his first broadcast of 17th August this year, and I quote, Dear Lagosians, the challenge of managing the Ebola virus is big, but our resolve to contain and defeat it is bigger. In speech after speech, Fashola brought new hope and a conquering spirit, using the power of words to great advantage, because that is essentially what leadership is at that level. He spoke of the challenges, but he also never failed to highlight the sacrifices of the health professionals. And now the situation was changing until we arrived at the point in which the possible spread of the virus was contained. Unfortunately, in the fight against insurgency, either at the center or within the operational areas of Boko Haram, we have not seen any demonstration of such armed for leadership. Today, our nation is at war, and we have actually been for more than a year now. Yet, there has been no official call to arms or an address to the people to make us understand the nature of the challenge we face, the sacrifices we must make, and the need to rally behind our troops while making provisions to those who will be caught in the crossfire of the war. Hundreds of thousands of our people have been displaced, with many running to Cameroon for succor, but there has not been any assurance from the highest political authority in the land that will share their pains, nor have we made provisions for their welfare. Yesterday, an official report of a visit to Cameroon by one of our institutions still alive to responsibilities, I'm happy my brother is here, stated, and I quote, we met a group of refugees from Nigeria they are packed at a stadium, coming mostly from Banki and some forests in Bornu State. Being a refugee must be the worst thing ever. Packed in a stadium like animals, waiting for the UNC, UNCHR to send in trucks to them to the former camp. The people we are talking about are our compatriots, mostly women and children. Innocent poor people who are living their lives before some lunatics came to turn everything upside down. Do we care about them? And if we do, what allowances have we made for them? But we are even going too far, given the welfare situation that once made 
our soldiers to mutiny and their wives to intervene that their husbands will not go to war. So in the absence of any coherent official declaration, either to provide for the young men and women we are sent to fight on our behalf, or to reassure the direct victims of the insurgency that they will not be abandoned, it is not too difficult to understand why the nation is divided on what should clearly unite all of us. However, I must point out that the failure at all levels and nobody, not even those in the opposition, can claim any moral high ground on the issue of Boko Haram. For instance, I fail to understand the motive of those who are ever quick to put down the achievements of our armed forces while romanticizing whatever claims made by some Boko Haram lunatics. It is even sad that many of these people talk about Boko Haram as if it was a charity organization that only became violent just because its leader was killed. And I can explain that. I mean, many people blame my late boss for Boko Haram simply because many people believe that he ordered the killing of the former leader, uh, Mohammed Yusuf. But while I will not condone state killing, I mean, I know what provoked my boss into taking whatever decision he took. Because I was there, I saw the photographs of the killing of the policemen. They were butch it was not killing, they were, they, were, they, were, they were massacred. And any leader will not condone that kind of thing, especially for security officials. But the way some people talk about Boko Haram, you will imagine they are members of the Boy Scouts. <laughs> Indeed, in the political season that we are in, it is no surprise that many half, at least in the past, try to take advantage of the insurgency before it exploded on all our faces. This now brings me to the fourth and last lesson we can learn from the regular experience. As we seek to put an end to the Boko Haram madness in our country, it is about taking personal responsibility as citizens. Whether we realize it or not, the choices we make in our little corners are as important as those made in Alausa and Nasoro. And that for me is the greatest lesson the Ebola challenge has taught us. I began with what both the Sultan and the President said about how we successfully fought Ebola. But if we can reflect, the first demonstration of leadership was at the first consultant hospital by a private citizen. As most Nigerians now know, the late Dr. Stella Adedefo, a consultant physician at the hospital, was at the head of the resistance against having Sawyer forcefully discharged as his prominent Nigerian friends and the Liberian embassy officials in Lagos desperately canvassed. By insisting that Sawyer could not leave the hospital until she was certain about his ailment, which eventually confirmed her suspicion, and by alerting the Lagos state authorities immediately the Ebola, Ebola virus red flag came off, and that was saved many lives even though she ended up losing her own. That was leadership. <laughs> we need such commitment to duty, sense of patriotism and professionalism on the part of our soldiers if we are to win the war on insurgency. And if our country is to attain peace and prosperity, we need such responsible citizenship at practically all levels of our society. What I am saying in essence is that all of us must play our part. There is so much that we can do as we seek to put an end to the Boko Haram insurgency, but the least is to support our troops. Before I take my seat, I must say that at this critical point in the life of our nation, when several of our people are hurting and we need men of God to speak ill, it is unfortunate that some of them would rather sow hatred and division. At a time the church should stand up to preach love, the message of the cross is being perverted to serve the partisan agenda of some pastors who gave our Lord Jesus Christ a bad name. More than ever before, we need peace in our country, and for that reason, Christians should be discerning about the kind of messages they listen to especially in the build-up to the 2015 general elections. No matter the pretensions to the contrary, and regardless of whatever party they associate with, Nigerian politicians worship on the same altar, and they know where they meet. 
So let no pastor deceive you into believing some politicians are better than the other because of the faith they profess. According to the Bible, which is our continuing as Christians, by their fruits we shall know them. The word as the common the word as the common saying goes is enough for the wise. Pastor Koju, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think my job is done. So let me now end my presentation with what is called the sufficient prayer in God's little instruction book for men. It is a prayer I love so much and one I want to leave as my takeaway this morning. Apology to Governor Fashola, who seems to have patented the phrase takeaway. And now to the prayer. Lord, when I am wrong, make me willing to change. When I am right, make me easy to live with. Strengthen me so that the power of my example will far exceed the authority of my rank. I thought we would say amen. Yeah. Thank you.